we are going to be joined by uh, some poets, uh, including Jeff Cass. But before we do that, I'm going to uh, sh- I'm going to show this video um, from Breaking Curfew from about oh eight years ago, so, uh, you know nine years ago, and this is uh, this is Garrett performing at Breaking Curfew. And creative writing was a big part of Garrett's life. Um, especially towards the end of high school. And it's such an important part of a lot of people's lives and what it, what it, what it's able to do for somebody and, and make them feel connected to others and express themselves is really wonderful. So we're grateful for the community in Ann Arbor uh, that um, fosters a lot of um, amazing writers and um, people, excuse me, teaching creative writing. So uh, without further ado, I'm a, I, I think this video is going to work. I feel good about this one. Let's, let's try it out. Let's try it out. What's up, everybody? It's really, really warm up here. I'm sorry, hold on one second. Stand up, kid. 
rearrange the building blocks of your perception here. Purple is the new pink. I've never been a fan of normal. Even if you were as blue as a smurf or the fattest baby ever birthed, you're still the same soul I put into you, man. How dare you question my plan? Regardless of your crusty ass fingernail. <laughs> Regardless if you were the least swag man on earth. And if you cry to me one more time, kid, I'm gonna kick you where it hurts. And isn't this where I should say that we focus on the flawed perceptions in our lives and ignore the grace that lies inside us? How we choose to view our flaws as scum? And even Megan Fox has ugly thumbs, so we know humans ain't perfect. We still choose to obsess over our outer surface. It's a life. Without much purpose. I pick my head up from the dirt. I stop wearing band-aids to cover my shame. The circles drilled in the skull of my nail will heal. The purple shade will fade to gray. A healthy nail will be reborn. <laughs> and until then, I will wear this nail like a badge of honor. I will march around with the pride of a majestic lion, riding hoist horseback, hoisting the sword of Breaking curfew uh, a while back. Um, I am now joined with Jeff Katz here. Let me fi let me fix up this video here, uh, uh, Jeff. How how are you today? I'm real good, man. Real good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess tell tell the people a little bit about what you do as a as a teacher and as a creative writer. Well, first of all, I'm real glad to be here to honor Garrett. Um, he was such a great kid, such a wonderful writer such a force in creative writing class and at the neutral zone. I really miss him a ton. Um, it was just a, it was an honor and a privilege to have him as a student. Um, I'm teaching at Pioneer High School. We're just getting ready for our new school year of remote learning, which is interesting. Um, and I continue to write and continue to have the great fortune of being able to connect with these many poets who I've had as students or in the past and, you know, who I, who I really enjoy hearing their work as they grow and continue to develop. Yeah, and that's and I was a student of yours as well. Uh, yes, Mario was day. amazing. Oh well, trying, trying, trying to be like you, man. Trying to be like Jeff. Um, so I guess without you know, without further ado, did you want to um, did you want to introduce some uh, get some poets out here? Yeah. So there's going to be six poets reading today. Um, over the next hour, each one will read for approximately. Uh, nine to ten minutes. I'm super excited for every single one of them because they're really fantastic writers. Uh, they're at various stages of their writing careers. Uh, yeah, there's a good picture <laughs> from back in the day. Um, there are various stages of their writing careers. Um, some who are published and they're on their second book. Some who have just got their first book came out. Um, some who are still in college. Um, but they're really, really wonderful writers, and I'm very excited to have them with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce our first poet now. Um, they have done incredible work over the years, um, working with young people in New York City, um, and their first book just came out. It's called Cut to Bloom. And if you want to read a book about the Asian American immigrant experience, about uh, LGBTQ uh, life and experiences in this country, um, it's an amazing amazing collection i think that you know if you if you re read one thing the rest of this year you know you won't be going wrong if you read cut to bloom by autumn Choi wild um i remember autumn as like a, a really enthusiastic student in class and i don't know that they were like that in all their classes but um in creative writing um autumn was just this force you know was there every day um, helping everyone else in the class, coming up in their work, giving feedback, 
And then their voice was just so strong, so powerful. Uh, they were one of the early superstars in the Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam scene, uh, helped set the stage for many young writers to come afterward. So it is a great pleasure that I present to you um, a really wonderful writer. Their book is Cut to Bloom. Here is Autumn Choi Wild. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction, Jeff. And um, you are 100% correct that I did not attend my other classes with as much enthusiasm as I attended yours. Um, I can safely say that your class got me to graduate from high school. Um, and I think I wouldn't be the only one um, to for that, who that's true. Um, but yeah, super excited to be here with you all today, um, especially for such an important fundraiser, uh, for such an important cause, and to honor the life of Garrett. Um, you know, mental health is something that we have to practice talking about since it is so often met with shame. And I want to dedicate this set to all the people who have been willing to hear my stories, um, the relationships that have helped me name and process the events in my life that have, been most, that have most impacted my own mental health. And, you know, my siblings and I grew up with an alcoholic, abusive father, and I don't know where I would be, honestly, without them. Um, their ability to, rate, to, to relate to my emotions and the steps I needed to take to process the events of our childhood and the ways that helped me feel not alone. Um, and these next two poems are for them. The Memory Keeper. Amma doesn't ask how I have this photo. I'm curled inside a basket of books with room enough to swing the spoon I hold. We left Korea in 92 without knowing we wouldn't return. All photos of mom's parents, all the happy ones of Appa left behind. In seventh grade, Mo and I went back. Uh, sorry, I was trying to read the chat, Mario. Um, in seventh grade, Mo and I went back. The year I discovered Tupac and played the greatest hits on repeat. Everything in our old room was left exactly the same. Our dollhouse in the closet, umbrella stand full of my baseball hats and baseball bats and plastic guns innocent with dust. I'm listening to Dear Mama when my older sister walks in, checking down the hallway before closing the door. Look, she says, quiet, pulling a pile from under her shirt. She has the one of her and me in a field of flowers. Mom in huge 90s glasses holding me as I reach for the camera. Mo at her first violin recital. Us again at the pool, floating like baby otters with green swim caps on. Let's bring them back, she says. Mom will be so happy to see these that she pulls out a photograph of her grandmother, the one before she got cancer, the one they used at the funeral, the one thing Oma wished she hadn't left behind. When my father finds out the photos are missing, he grabs Mo by her long, thick braid and shoves her against the wall. She crumples like how the ash of a cigarette holds its shape until it submits to the earth. I'm still listening to Tupac when she sneaks back into Appa's room while he's out for another six pack. When we get home two weeks later, the bruises on her face and back have disappeared. She uses all the money she saved and takes the photos to the shop to get them framed. There's the one where she's dancing in Swan Lake, the one where being lizards on the couch. The one where her hair is in a braid again and she is holding me, her thin arm wrapped around my shoulders, like she's the only one who can trick the world into bringing me what is mine. Latchkey Coronation. When your sister leaves for college, you can't ask her to stay. So you let yourself cry only on the drive to the dorm room and not when you close the door or walk in again because Mo calls you back, your relief so palpable you could tuck it under the single framed bed. You should be celebrating. Now the new crown king of the $20 left under the telephone for dinner, the choice between pizza or cigarettes, gas or weed, entirely your own. You avoid her room for weeks until you can pretend it's always been this way. Driving alone to pick up little sister, bringing her to camp, filling out the forms, packing her lunch and adding little notes to at least one of you. 
will wait to be picked up from school without worrying she'd been forgotten, will know hunger is a pebble to collect, then return to the shore of the lake, will know if she makes a mistake she will have someone to apologize to, will know how easy it is to make people bend for her. Then later, perhaps, what it's like to be the one who falls to her knees. Um, thank you all. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so I wrote this next poem as a mantra to myself to help me get through a breakup. And if there is anyone listening in um, who is also struggling with that right now, um, I hope this poem can help remind us that the only constant is change, right? That no matter how overwhelming and surmountable life might be, um, that is the only thing we know, that the times will keep, keep shifting. Um, this is called the scavenger's prayer. I stand in the ocean, the wind dark against my face and salty hair. Never have I been stranded by the sunrise, the black slowly turning to gray, and now come the pelicans. I think of all the people before me who have come to be washed clean by the water. I too will trail my fingers along the surface, making my own small waves. I too will stay in the salt until I've empty my blood of her face, until I can believe in more than how hard I quake, come to love the sound of cracking open, just like when the waves come and the scavengers of the sea break into flight. Um, thank you all so much for listening and being here. Um, I unfortunately have to cut out after this last poem because I have a meeting for the school year that's opening up. Um, I just mentioned I work at a school in New York City and um, I would love to stay and listen to everyone else's poems, um, but the school year commences. Um, so it's, it's especially joyful to get to share this little bit of time with you all here today. Um, Thank you, too, for your support of mental health. Um, it is something that needs to be more part of our national conversation, that needs to be more of our daily conversation. Um, and I want to end my set with the last poem in my book um, called Split the Shape. And if um, anyone is interested, I am sending out signed copies of the book. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Autumn C. Wild. Um, I would love to send you a copy if you're interested. All right, this poem is called Split to Shape. In our first year of marriage, I couldn't stop testing for cracks. Children who raise other children learn that nothing is certain. Food can come out of a box, a bin, a welt. Rules can be a fist, not enough, too much. Children can it be an excuse, a ruse, a sore. Because I was both an excuse and a sore, I can forgive my mother now. My degrees paid for in full. My younger sister saved from memories of a father she never met. Mother's desperate years, only a story she knows. In a house full of children holding keys, the only rule is to not become like the one with the fist, the monster under the bed. Father gone, but not what he has cost, so my wife knows the monster too well. Be perfect, it says a picture of order and habits, because who in their right mind could divorce perfect? Cook, cook meals for the whole week on Sundays, plan all weekends for the month in advance, and also assume her disappointment means her disappearance, a raised tone, a smack. And while my wife retreats to the other room, I'm trying to remember that this is my house and my choice, my fist, my rules to be thrown like a brick against a thick, incessant dark, but how quickly my body raises the alarm, remembers the formulas from childhood, and yet, here's my wife pulling me out of my curl on the couch. Here are her strong hands willing me back to her Brooklyn apartment, here in the morning with my cup of coffee. Most days, it is hard to remember I'm worthy to be loved, even without the right answer, the right joke, the right moment. And yet, here's my wife, trying to tell me a story around her toothbrush, bragging about me to her parents, bringing my favorite dessert home, as if I could still be an unpredictable ending that she wants to see unfold. 
Thank you, everyone. Much love. Wow. Give it up for Autumn. Oh, my goodness. Autumn, that is so powerful. Thank you so much. Good luck starting your school year. Um, yeah, the, the name of that poet, Autumn Choi Wilds, and their book is Cut to Bloom. Wonderful, incredible book. Um, I absolutely adored it, and it was just such an amazing experience as a teacher to see your students uh, create such powerful art um, and put it out in the world. So thank you again, Autumn. Um, really love having you here and always love having you in class. So great to hear you read. Thank you so much. All right, our next writer. Uh, bye, Arnold. Uh, our next writer, I really wanted to include um, some writers from the neighborhood um, in which Garrett lived and frolicked and had a lot of fun. Um, and so, you know, Andy Tappenden is a, is a kid who grew up in Burns Park as well. Um, I know her from field hockey and lacrosse and her being really good friends with my daughter for years and years and years. Um, she went to community high school and was a member of our Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam team in 2018, I guess. Yeah, 2019. Yeah, 2019. Um, really, uh, it's such a joy to watch her become the writer that she is becoming. She's now in, about to begin her second year at college. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that is at the moment. I think she was at Swarthmore last year, um, and it's either going to be Swarthmore or uh, the one next club. I forget what that's called um, this year. So please welcome Andy Tappenden. Um, this is a young writer, and you'll be able to say you got to see her work just when she was getting started. Hi. Um, thank you for that introduction, Jeff. Um, yes, this is very exciting to be here. Um, I don't have a long introduction, so I will just start reading. Um, this first poem is from my first year of college um, when I was um, super far away from everything. It felt like, um, and I was very homesick and lonely, and um, I noticed that I kept writing. Yeah, you'll see. Um, okay, yeah, so this first poem is called Ode to Polar Vortex. Why can't I write about home without writing about winter? Standing on the frozen lake with the people I love, I'm used to winter being something scary. December becomes larger than a month. Cut icicles and choruses and Papa's story about walking home at midnight. Talking about the cold like a hired assassin, cracked fingers and knees, and I just knew I had to keep walking, at least. I had to go. Why do I miss winter as a familiar danger? Why is missing home just missing a comfortable kind of pain? Last February, when I would walk home from school, my dad reminded me to wear gloves. Talking about frostbite. And my dad, who grew up where winter is a season of northern lights where the sun rose and set all in a school day, a weekday of darkness, a weekday of fluorescent lights, and then a night of pink sky, purple sky, which eventually becomes no sky at all. I mean, when I write about home, I am writing about two different places. I'm writing about no place at all. I'm writing about winter. Last January, we joked about the polar vortex. We stayed inside for days, weeks. It became a joke. How long will they delay school before the roof caves in? Stay outside for more than 10 minutes and you'll freeze to death. Who comes up with these numbers anyway? Still, we stayed inside. Why do I miss the winter that wanted to kill me? The winter that tried to bury itself in my lungs? Or do I just miss all the parts that burned within it? Does that make sense? I'm trying to write a plate, I'm trying to write about a place that I didn't realize was a place until I left. This year, I left all of the people I love, but it's been so much easier to love myself. Maybe I left them with the best version, the best version because I was with them. There are days I've wanted to say, you should have seen me last year. You should have seen me in winter. It was cancel a week of school when there's no snow kind of cold. Hug each other closer kind of cold. Cheeks pink, fingers burning, remembering you have bones, kind of cold. Every breath hurts, kind of cold. Every breath 
is on purpose. Yes. Um, that's my first one. Um, my second poem is um, a quarantine poem from April, kind of also about being lonely, kind of. Anyways, it doesn't really have a title. Um, yeah. Quarantine has me writing love poems for all of my friends. But last night, my hand couldn't stop shaking to think. Last night, all of my written words wanted to quiver out of themselves, and I don't blame them for wanting to make something new and absent meaning. I don't blame quarantine either for making me grow back into myself, inward like crystals, instead of outward like a disease. Quarantine has me naming all of my new playlists after fruit, like tunes dripping all over me. Let me sing today to you. Listen to all this growth that is leaving me sticky. Quarantine has me treating decision making like a competitive sport. I Google, should I transfer schools? I Google, is my hair thinning? I Google, did she love me or just the lovely things I do? Inside, all of my worlds stack on top of one another and become not mine. I'm surrounded by almost every version of myself. The self who lied on the red sofa for an hour, thinking about a her I don't think about anymore. The self who wore a different color of eyeshadow every morning. Gold, plum, pink. The self who wrote the poem but didn't read it. The self who thought, is this something a person I want to be would do? Or just something I would do? I write love poems, and sometimes there's both the good and the bad. The pomegranate seed and the husk. The chorus and the chorus love poem, curving in and out of my relationships like a glass snake like a lonely pedestal, like how I wake up and the sun has risen without me, but at night, everyone is my best friend. Okay. okay. I think I have two more poems that I have prepared to read. Um, this third poem is called Self-Portrait as Pearl, and Pearl is the main character of my favorite book, which I'm not sure is my favorite book anymore, but a book I love, and at one point was my favorite book, at least when I wrote this. And the book is The Changeling by Joy Williams. I love that book. Okay. Um, yeah, Self-Portrait as Pearl. At some point, my favorite book becomes its own emotion, its own constellation of memory. Ask me about the story, and I will tell you how I read it the April when everything started blooming too soon. The April that the sky fell like a rock I'd been carrying too long. The narrative takes the structure of a mirror, social media account, stain remover, and becomes about how the main character had a drinking problem the same night I wore my green dress. How I forgot her name until I reread her again this year, but each time she drilled a hole into my side and drained both our blood. How she was allergic to emotion, while I poured life into myself every morning. And now I can't think of that spring without crying her tears. And now my throat burns in an uglier way. I keep following pathways lined with gray glass. I keep cutting my tongue, my teeth, and nothing comes out. What is the quote about life wanting to be like art? What is the quote about life wanting? How do we, I rewrite what can't be written? Rewrite what I never wrote? I read the first 100 pages in a bed that wasn't mine. I read the first 100 pages in one night, discovering that a story builds a world. Just as quick as it tears it down, I'm no longer talking about her. This is about me now. All right, I have one more poem, very short, that I wrote last month. Um, yeah, it's called It's Vacation, because I read it on vacation. Okay. I start on a new medication, and it makes my whole body shake. I shake, and I tell myself that I don't miss stillness. I stare at the water. I slip in and out of myself like when you swallow a whole oyster and salt lines your throat for hours. I don't eat oysters, but I'm imagining that it feels like that. You know, I'm imagining that my throat swallows and then regrets the swallow. I'm imagining how I feel and then I'm waiting to feel it. Thank you. Wow, Andy, that was amazing. Oh my God. Like I just wrote down some lines. I shake 
and I tell myself I don't miss stillness. Why do I miss winter as a familiar danger? The sky felt like a rock I've been carrying too long. What beautiful, beautiful writing. Thank you so much for being part of it um, and sharing your work with us today, Andy. I look forward to reading your books as they come out and come out and come out over the next 30 or 40 years. Thank you so much for joining us. Wow. Oh, man. Okay. Our next poet is a poet I've known for a long time, and also Andy's known for a long time. As I mentioned, they kind of grew up together um, in, the, in the Burns Park neighborhood playing lacrosse and, and field hockey together. Uh, Sam Cass is um, now a second-year student at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, and Sam was a huge part of the Neutral Zone uh, writing when she was uh, here in Ann Arbor. She is a five-time Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam team member. Um, has won a ton of awards for her writing, uh, Scholastic Writing Awards, and, uh, you know, was a finalist for the Ann Arbor Youth Poet Laureate, um, all kinds of great stuff. So um, I know you're really going to enjoy Sam's work. I also say about Sam, um, she's probably the person who's taught me the most about mental health challenges um, for teenagers, and I really had to learn a lot um, as a person, you know, a, a father and as a teacher about what young people go through. And, and Sam has helped me to understand a lot more about what young people um, sometimes are challenged with. So please welcome Sam Cass. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing my poetry and honored to share the stage, Zoom stage with you all. Um, so yeah, I have a few poems. Um, here's my first one. My favorite sound is the sound that hummingbirds make. I read my preschool journals when I don't know what else will make me smile. I flip through pages of half memories, recall the girl who wore the same PJ dress every day except for when dressed as an undertaker, led the class in funeral services. I try to find her under years of avoiding graveyards. I like the sound of trucks going by. The posters in the school bathroom say, count three things you can hear. Five things you can touch, smell, taste, remind your body what it feels like to be alive. I wish I could walk with my shoes off in the snowy streets. I share the best ones with my brother and we laugh until our stomachs clench. I wish to get older soon. In preschool, I told my wishes to everyone and still felt confident they would come true. Now, I sit on the floor of my room after hours of fighting toy soldiers in my brain, ripping apart my limbs in the mirror, megaphone anxiety drowning out all other thoughts. Tell myself, the girl who was friends with everyone, who circled double happy at daily check-ins still exists. Curious, listening to the world, beautiful. Dear Sam, I love you. Love, Sam. Awesome. Um, all right. So here's my next poem, um, which I think is I often I have a lot of like anxiety and OCD. Um, and these are things that I was diagnosed with in high school um, and writing about has really helped. Um, and I think. Having so much anxiety about the world, sometimes um, I've had a lot of. It's, it's been a, a relief um, to be able to study the world through a more scientific lens sometimes. And like, I don't know, I just find a lot of parallels. Um, so this is a poem about I was doing a science lab in um, one of my high school classes where like the goal was to learn how like molecules form reactions. But eventually, like there's a stable um, level that the molecules will be at. So it's called equilibrium. It's Monday, and I know now why everyone picked Tuesday, Thursday lab hour. Aftertaste from arguing with my mom feels like precipitate product undissolved as fluorescent light bounces my reflection back in the window. Hair up, goggles down, eyes puffy begging for an instantaneous synthesis of new friends or less brittle confidence. Today, we are testing equilibrium. We are testing balance. How the solution naturally goes back to stable on Tuesdays, I have therapy. 
It's Monday, so I have to convince myself the world isn't dangerous. The chemicals blend a lavender turquoise bubble over yesterday. At practice, my friend was carted to the hospital with a migraine. My head hurts, too. I can't handle any more spinning spend, too long fighting a torrent of avoidance paralysis by sprawling across pages of tiny grass squares. Smell like Auntie Annie's pretzels. Bubbles like marshmallows today is my favorite lab yet. I light the Bunsen burner with hands that don't feel scarred. Watch the light play on the windows. Add CO2 until the solution shifts blue to pink, lonely to blush, cold to warm. Heat and COH206, 2 plus and 4, Cl to COCl4, 2 minus and 2H2O backward and forward, faster, slower. I watch the bubbles disappear into air. Faster, slower, shift right. Shift left, nothing breaks this beautiful cycle. The constant stays the same. Eventually, the reactants and products dance with each other, shimmy around the ballroom in dynamic equilibrium. On Tuesday, I tell Rachel I don't have faith I can take care of myself. Imagine triple beam balances, friends driving drunk after midnight, lit Bunsen burners being chased as I run home, magnesium oxide explosions, it feels like the gas is always on. I surprise myself by taking labs, despite all the possibilities to explode. Read the Flynn scientific warnings front to back, wash my hands hard after even the softest chemical. But this morning, I look forward to watching the sun break across the pioneer lawn. Wait for metal to melt beaker to cool compounds to break down to their purest form. Copper and dichloride, constantly in motion. Forward, backward, faster reaction. Shifts right, color shifts left. No matter what happens, copper bonds with hydrogen, loses its charge, balances. The solution, always back to stable. Awesome. Um, yeah, okay, so I think I have two, um, yeah, I think there's time for two more poems. Um, the next one is a newer one, um, so we'll see, first time reading it, um, to others, um, but I think I'm back at school right now, and there's a lot going on in the world right now, as there always is, um, and I... It's interesting because one of the things that's happening back on campus is just like hanging out outside a lot. Um, And I think I've had a lot of nights where I've been outside with friends and we've just been thinking about the world, um, which is like kind of been great for poetry writing. So, um, yeah, this is about one of those moments. Stargazing, August 2020. You say you once fucked a boy who thought only of the environment while he kissed you. When I think of the environment, it makes me want you more, or at least desire this kind of burning, the kind where we lie on a blanket in the wet grass and name scars, stars that are dead already and make wishes anyway. We're losing redwoods in the California fires that are older than Christ, you say. I don't know where this leaves me with religion. Tonight, the moon shines so bright, these new trees cast infinite shadows. It reminds me of a scene in Melancholia. You know the one I'm talking about. The moon looks like it might come to eat it, eat us up. If it doesn't, something else will. I'm terrified and it makes me want to kiss you. I want to kiss you and that makes me no longer afraid. What fire this gives us, wondering if there will be anyone left to watch us burn. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I have one last poem. Um, and this one is about a friendship bracelet that you might see here. Um, I think part of my anxiety and OCD is around this idea of pr- productivity. And I think during quarantine, um, and just like a change in how I'm spending my time, it has been really stressful to think about like, being really productive all the time. And so I just want to remind everyone who's tuned in right now um, that you don't have to be productive all the time. 
um, as my mom says to me, you're in the right space. Um, so I just want to share that and also read this poem um, because it really resonates with how I'm feeling right now. Friendship bracelet. I made a friendship bracelet for my left wrist. Turquoise and orange like July. It reminds me of sunsets over my grandparents' house. It has three double knots, three attempts to bow tie using only my right hand. It has hundreds of other knots too. Lined up like cormorants on the big rock. Blue over blue over blue. Orange peeks through at random intervals. Messy rose. It bunches and curves over my wrist in an awkward embrace. The bracelet stays wet for a long time after I wash my hands. Fades and grows gray with dirt. I play with all three sets of fringes. Twist it back and forth until friction burns my skin. My fingers are always moving. I made this bracelet over a few days. In the minute before English class, during, during unproductive assemblies, feeling sick and sleepy on a long car ride, I am always moving, always getting something done. I often feel guilty about how I spend time, squeak out single math problems between classes, read four sentences, do a set of leg, raise, leg raises or rewrite homework assignments in my planner just to check them off again every moment is spent looking forward to a time when I feel free. This bracelet felt like a waste of time, selfish, as if I could only justify mindless nodding as a gift for a friend each time over and under around the string. I wondered what else I could be doing, but I carried it with me until my fingers found the string instead of pencil until it didn't feel like a waste of time, until it wasn't. Even though the bracelet is loose enough to take off, I don't. This kind of self-love is loose enough to slip off to. Is a half-made friendship bracelet delicate, but growing stronger, not by not. All right. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you all um, for supporting and continuing to support um, such an amazing space. Um, I'm really honored to share the stage here and just really appreciate um, everyone here. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> that was incredible. Um, it's hard for me to talk about Sam's work because it's just <laughs> so powerful to me. But thank you, Sam, for sharing. That was uh, fantastic as always, and so great to see you. And what a background. I need a background like that for my poems, too. Um, all right. Our next writer um, is another incredibly talented uh, young person, um, now a student at the University of Michigan. I'm not sure if I'm entering third or fourth year. As I get older, I can't keep track of these things. Um, but Dylan Gilbert um, was a two-time member of the Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam team and Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam champion, um, has won Hopwood Awards, at the University of Michigan um, for her writing, a very powerful uh, voice. I can't tell you um, how excited I get whenever I know Dylan's about to read because I know that I'm going to learn something, I'm going to be entertained, my thoughts are going to be provoked. Uh, just an incredible, incredible writer. Please welcome Dylan Gilbert. Hi, thanks for the introduction. Um, I think I have three poems I'm going to read today. Um, some of them are, like, two of them are kind of long. And content wording for, like, mentioning of suicide. Um, I think that's the only content wording I have. But thank you very much for letting me be here today. I'm excited to read with you guys. Okay. This is a poem I wrote about uh, when the blood moon happens. When I'm forced to breathe the driest cold, the kind that chaps my lips and lungs and leaves me splintering. When I'm too far from sand and the sun is all too selfish. When I cannot be enveloped in an ocean, I am forced to become one. Or not forced, or yes, forced, but it is gentle. The softest power handles me with gloves and only moves what is under the skin. I'm swayed by the moon like I was expelled from a part in her thighs. I'm 86% water or some other shocking number, and I think that makes me just as child as the sea. I swell and fall flat. 
I leak salt and have even drowned a few bodies. I hold reflections. If you put a mirror to another mirror, don't they just bounce light off one another? If I stand under the moon on a night with no clouds, will we play catch with the sun's excess? Will she feel me back? How do you repay a parent? The other night, mother bled all over the sky and I didn't even gather a cloth for her. Didn't even ask if she was okay. Just drank all her pomegranate stained haze, selfish and horny and hiccuping I didn't even bother to ask. Typical teenager, self-obsessed and drunk. I can't buy the moon a house and I've made something of myself. How do you repay a parent that only knows giving and nothing else? Not even your name. Okay, that's one. Um, let me find my other one. Okay. This poem is about Catholicism, which is a big topic in my poems as of late processing growing up in the Catholic Church. Um, in the house of God. In the house of God, they hand me a book called Suffering. Twelve years old, and I am ushered into a closet of a room with a man I cannot see. The door closes heavy behind me, and I wonder why my parents sent me here. Tight room, strange man. Didn't they warn me about this? You have to go to confession to be confirmed in the Catholic Church. You must bleed muddy and beg to be cleaned. I quietly admit to watching porn and suddenly there is an eye between the slits of the partition. The priest wants to see my face, wants me to really hear him when he tells me I am a girl. A girl, do I understand that I will be a lady come Sunday? And I know the act is not a sin anymore, I am. The sex is not dirty, I am. The wanting did not soil me, but I it. And I know now what I am meant for, to lay and wait for a man to see me and stop. If I'm lucky, maybe stay for a minute. When I'm 15, I break up with my first girlfriend. And I tell her it's because we are wrong. Tell her I love her, but I love my family more. Tell her I love her, but I fear father more. Tell her I know this feeling. With every good touch, I become dry, cold shame, blue eyes between dark wood. Sometimes I still find myself praying after sex. I repent for every two good feelings slip the sign of cross between sheets. In the house of God, they hand me a book called Suffering, but this time I make a meal of it, slip my tongue on the pages and finally drink from my own cup. I taste better than communion and I wasn't the first to say it. God's river must not have been salted blue as mine. I am the well that never runs dry. I can hear your shallow breath from here. I know you're thirsty too. Uncork me, sit plum, sticky and leaking. They didn't make this aching bountiful for nothing. The church would be hungry and withering without me. Who would it feast on? Who would it point a crooked finger at if not queer woman pleasure seeking? Lift the cup, wet your mouth. That sweet bite on your lips is me. Jesus, you did nothing but love your daddy and die. Did nothing but fish and drink good wine. Baby, baby, I'm so sorry, baby. How did they make such a burning out of you? Do you think they've ever probed metal into their own palm? I have. Bled by choice just to see if I could still hurt just to see how warm I was. I heard we all need a little suffering. Better to punish myself than have my father do it. Better to control the bleed than leave it up to a man. Jesus, I've hurt in your name, could have died by your name. Oh God, I really am your child. Look how I bleed, see how it wrenches me. Unthread my veins and everything grows but me. I scream and they salivate. I spill and every head tilts back. Every mouth opens. Call me son, call me sacrifice, call me mm so rich and sweet. Okay, and I think I have time for my last poem. Um, which is right here. Sorry, one second. All my poems are all different places. Okay, here it is. This is called I'll Stay in November. Last spring, I stopped diagnosing myself and let someone else do it for me. I was 17 when I made my parents come home from church early, when I thought I had depression and they thought I'd need to spend more time with my family, with God. And so I did. I prayed when I woke up, prayed when night came rushing home, prayed when sirens broke through air, prayed when I had an ugly thought, prayed when the news bled onto my screen, prayed when I remember my mom could die, prayed when I remembered everyone else could too. Prayed to be a better person, prayed for a body that had never been touched, prayed for one that people wanted to. 
prayed for forgiveness after I prayed myself into a good Catholic girl, prayed myself into an impulse, into another symptom of my anxiety. Religion covers up my nervous tics so well, I almost seemed like a good person, almost seemed like I was doing something to get better, almost didn't have to admit I was sick. I wonder if this is why my grandma was in the church choir, a lady of the night who sang God everywhere. I wonder what hurt she was slipping between testaments. In June, I chose to walk down the hall instead of using the scissors in my drawer. In June, I took a bat to my parents' worldview. In June, I told my mother if she didn't take me to the hospital, I was going to die. I didn't sleep for four days, lost 18 pounds in two weeks. I am sick. I am sick. I am sick. I am still sick. And I'm alive and choosing to be so. It is November and I have something to say and it's true. I don't want to kill myself. I don't want anyone else to kill me either. There are no loopholes that lead to me dying this month. If those words made their way out of my mouth from May till October, they were probably a lie or at least not a certainty. But now there is snow on the ground and I have people that I am certain about. I felt my grandmother everywhere this month. I smell her perfume in lectures and in open air, I feel her lips on my cheek when I'm half asleep. When the doctors asked for medical history, my dad shook his head, but my mom said his mother was sick like me. And why not? I have her nose, her neck, her ears, her inconsistent laugh, and her teeth. My grandmother said I looked like his wife even when he was slipping out of his body and was more cataracts and eyes. Oh, I feel my grandmother everywhere. For the first time, this illness hasn't felt lonely. The first time, my brain feels more like an inheritance than disappointment. My depression, anxiety, and heirloom my grandmother gave to my father and he gave to me. I will wear it everywhere. Wear it proud. Wear it with warm skin even when it strains my neck and hangs on heavy. In April, I called my sick something too much of too much imagination and attention seeking. Now I call it valid, call it a birthright, call it the price I pay and will pay again to have been made in the spotted and dimpled image of Bernadette. That's it. Thanks for letting me read with you guys. It's been an honor. Wow, Dylan, that was absolutely phenomenal. Holy smokes, Dylan. Whoa. I'm just like, I wrote down so many lines. I don't even know, like, where to start. Oh, my God. That's really amazing, Dylan, to watch you grow as a writer. That was just phenomenal work. It's so powerful. Thank you so much, Dylan, for continuing to write and for being you. Uh, that was so great. All right. Uh, our last youth – well, she's not really a youth anymore. Our last younger poet um, is someone who was a classmate and contemporary of, of Garrett's. So I wanted to save her for last. Um, she's really amazing writer. Uh, her first book called I Wore My Blackest Hair came out a couple of years ago. It's a phenomenal poetry collection. Uh, that was preceded by a short cla- uh, chapbook collection called Here I Go Torching, which is also amazing. And I'm so excited that in the spring, a brand new book is going to come out from Carlita Duan called Alien Miss. Uh, Carlita is currently getting her PhD in English and Education at U of M. Uh, she has an MFA from Vanderbilt, and she has been published in so many places. Uh, just an absolute superstar. Um, wow. Yeah, her new book coming out is going to be Alien Miss. Don't miss that one. So please welcome Carlita Duan. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Cass, for that beautiful introduction. Um, it's so sweet to gather here digitally with everyone and to just join the company of all these amazing poets. Um I just want to say before I start reading, just thanks to Garrett Space and what an amazing fundraiser to celebrate the lineage of such an amazing person. Um, And I hope the poems that I read today can just celebrate Garrett and all the love and the power that his presence continues to, his memory continues to bring in all of our lives. Um, And so Garrett, wherever you are, I love you and I miss you and um, thank you for being my friend. Um, I'm going to start with this poem. It's a newer poem. It's called Oh Cloudy Day. Wearing dark purple lipstick, I face the backyard. Grass grows in uneven yellow clumps. Running out of words to name my fear, I choose instead to bow down today, every day, to bless you, dirt. Dry grass that tries still to green. Bless you, tiny red flower, your stem long and slender like antenna, you putter from the trees. I put on a dress, I the mirror, I invite spring. 
Today I'll sit in a flower bed, watch the sky inherit a thousand clouds. Running out of words to name my fear, I choose instead to bless the skin beneath my elbows, my loose change, all the to-do lists I've made and pasted to my mirror, fluttering in the wind like papery kites. Bless every box I've left unchecked, every responsibility I've shirked, every call I've pressed ignore to, all the words I've wanted to offer and haven't yet wrapped my tongue around. Wearing dark purple lipstick and a belt, I face the backyard to kiss the air. When Yusuf says, loving you is an honor. When Haley texts me another little dragon song. When Jeremy sends me a photograph of the house plant I gifted him for his birthday in December. And oh, he writes, it's grown a flower. Some sort of violet, I think. And yes, there's a tiny baby purple star tilting up from the pot. I've been afraid of so much to wear a mask, to take a walk, to touch the ones I love. But oh, spring of chalk art, balloons and starfish, spring of dirt holding the worms. I lift my hand to you. Spring, fill me up. That was a quarantine poem, <laughs> in case you didn't catch the, the mask reference. Um, I'm going to read another poem that's uh, about lineage and about legacy and thinking just about, um, yeah, thinking about an inheritance of, of love. And so when I think about Garrett, one of one of my favorite memories is just of uh, slurping noodles at Tomukin with him and just all the different forms of and ways of loving that, that he taught me, one of the lessons that I carry with me today. Um, this is a poem... It's called Vision While Running on the Vanderbilt Indoor Track. Um, and just there's three names that y'all should know um, before listening to this poem. One is Teresa Tung. So she is um, a Taiwanese folk singer. Um, one is Clara Lee, the first Chinese American woman to vote. And the last one is my Nai Nai or my grandma. So I'll read this poem. Vision While Running on the Vanderbilt Indoor Track. Three minutes in. And those I've dared to call God in my mind push me on. Teresa Tung, Clara Lee, my Nai Nai, clad in blue silk slippers, shouting, go, go, while my will sags into the folds of a wet tank top. Brown track, white shoelace, blue smooth love I had for the river I flew past on a train last spring, returning to a square room with somebody who wrapped gifts for me and left them in a pile on the wooden table, books about olive trees shying beneath shimmering sleeves of paper, but shh, Nai Nai sits on the bridge of my nose, telling me to shut up. Wallowing in heartbreak won't serve you a mile, she snaps, and I'm sluggish, heavy, panting a thousand hurried breaths, watching the basketball sail and lean arcs below the track, the clock flashing red pixels, the ceaseless dribble. When I think I can't survive, the next minute, the next hour, February with all my lonely and beads of sweat, Women slip into their clouds and chop off their hair, let it hail over me, black stuff, the scent of licorice and steam. I'm running, carrying these women in my shoes, on my back. They're hollering my name, cracking into me like oyster shells with wild tons, clacking sets of teeth. I can't go on, I try to tell them, but they're playing pool in my mouth, saliva beads and I swallow, tiny women in my stomach telling me they're the boss of me now, go run, run, the way they did all those years ago, Nai Nai learning how to read by salvaging newsprint from the factory's lean bins, deciphering the curly characters, she, her, hers, mouthing the words for chain, change, running her way to night class after canning each aluminum tub of peaches. Clara Elizabeth Chan Lee running to the polling booth, her name laid fresh on a sheath of paper, run, gripping the ballot tight in her fist, darkening bubbles, tracing each letter swoop and curl. I choose, I choose, I choose. Teresa Tung running to a microphone, her tongue flitting between Mandarin, Hokkien, Cantonese, English, high notes strung like lines of syrup across a room. Ni wen wa ai ni o duo shen 
run into the moon or into the sun girls would swing into decades later, eating bagels with cream cheese at the car wash, Teresa's voice shrill and hopeful, discs blasted on loop, run, the woman in me chant, enclosing me in earthbound duty till I'm whirring mid-flight, leaving behind one step, 1,000, run, I'm loved, I love, run, till I can't feel the ache in me anymore, and I'm not lonely, I'm not lonely, I'm stuffed to the seams with old laughter, throngs of it, a line of women in my chest, urging me to let it fly, blessing me to move, move, move. Um, so that's that poem. Um, I think I have time for just one more, so I'm going to read... Um, one last piece here, and again, it's such an honor to just share space with everyone to celebrate Garrett's memory. Um, I miss him so much, and um, I'm just so happy to, to celebrate his memory with you all today. Um, this poem is called, On Mackinac Island, I Cast a Spell. Summer in Michigan with my hair up and my neck released to the wind, breathless flap and gild of fish skin sitting in ice chips at the market. A dog remains chained to a skinny pole. A woman spikes a ball fast over the net. Oh, riverbed, oh, sash tied around my neck. Oh, lips, I part as I walk past a new body of water and love what I love and stir it all into a cauldron, eggplant, plastic fork, black and wet eye wetted to the water. I fashion a kite out of old skirt hems. I push two silver buttons through my earlobes. I admire the rows of produce, yams, beets, Onions, roses plump with green veins. A day is juicy with clouds. A body juicy when kissed. Summer in Michigan with air parting delicious for my knees as I roll down the hill on a blue bike. Past the horses pattering clip-clop along a dirty street. Past the fudge shop thick with blocks of sugar. On my bike, I roll and I roll and I fall. Tumble near the lake where a garden snake hunkers on the shore and my breath goes up then down, these lungs, winged instruments, I take into my body, then let fly. Awesome. Thank you all so, so, so much. Wow, Carlina. Wow, unbelievable. Man, I love those poems so much. Like that, oh, this running one and like stuff to the scenes with old laughter. So incredible. Thank you, Carlina. Wow. So, yeah, Carlina's book that's out now is called I Wore My Blackest Hair, which is amazing. Also about language and the immigrant experience and her parents. Um, and then Alien Miss is coming out in the spring. You don't want to miss that. Carlina Dwan, just an absolute superstar. Thank you so much for sharing and for talking um, about Garrett. Wow. OK. I feel like I don't, you know, measure up to these writers. I think I'm just going to read two poems here. To, uh, to close this thing out. So, um, yeah, um, 2020 has been a heck of a year. I don't think any year can uh, compare to 2020 in terms of just, like, stress and awfulness and, and chaos, right? Um, but for me, also 2016 was a really hard year, 2016, 2017. Um, that was the year that I was working in addition to being a full-time teacher and uh, 20 hours a week or so at the neutral zone, also uh, delivering pizzas for a cottage in uh, a couple nights a week. And that was a really tough year. Um, the book that I wrote about that experience is called Teacher Slash Pizza Guy. Um, and it's got, I don't know, it was named the Michigan Notable Book for 2020. So you might want to check it out. Um, the first piece I want to read, I think, is reflective of some of the unrest we've been looking at um, over the last little while. And also, um, just as we start school and we start thinking about, um, you know, culturally responsive teaching and things that we can do as teachers. So this one is called uh, Marty Blows Up. And it's actually a memory of another, like, really great writer uh, named Marty, who is one of our really cool poets at the Neutral Zone. Uh, so Marty Blows Up. In government class, he and his peers watch a video, Donald Trump on The View, arguing why he doesn't trust Obama's birth certificate. Whoopi Goldberg fires back loud and angry, but the white women on the show stay silent. 
bows to the hands folded above the fray. That nipped at me, Marty says. If he's being a racist, how come only black people seem to care? Marty's got glasses and talks with his hands and sometimes eats lunch in my classroom and likes to describe complex anime narratives or Super Smash Brothers strategies while I sort of pay attention. It's kind of like, Marty goes on, when a teacher picks out a black kid who's got his phone out and the white kids texting under their desks don't say anything. They just keep on doing what they're doing. It's like whatever teacher the teacher saying to the black kid has nothing to do with them at all. All right. Um, I got to read one more poem. The book, Teacher Slash Pizza Guy, is not really a happy book. It's a difficult book because it was a difficult time. But I don't want to read, like, unhappy poems when thinking about Garrett because, like Carlita said, he was just such a wonderful presence in terms of someone who brought, like, great joy to the room that he was in. So, you know, if there was one thing uh, that was okay about this experience working at Cottage Inn and delivering pizzas, you know, after a full day of school and then work until four in the morning, this is it. So this is my one happy poem from the collection, and this will close out our poetry reading. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Mario, for inviting us to be part of this uh, program. It's called I Be Lying. I Be Lying. If I didn't admit there are some perks. In the grand concourse of human events, what feels better than concocting for oneself a crispy, thin crust opus that would never appear on the menu? How about no sauce? But slather a swath of garlic butter for your savory base. Spread a fistful of cheddar, some grated parm, maybe throw in a few crumbles of feta. Add fresh tomatoes, enough green olives to feed a middle school, pickles, a few slender and tender slices of salami, mushrooms, onions, a battalion of banana peppers. You're stinging now, bro. Go ahead and slide it into the oven. That pulmonary engine of gastro economy from it in the storefront middle that feeds everything else we do. That behemoth's working for you now, not for the pleasure of some customer waiting with a hefty wallet but for the pleasure of you and the 12 minutes you'll have to chow down before howling out on your next run head into the back room and knock off some dishes while you're waiting attack some dough trays make that back room glisten feel the ache in your fingers and the chill in your sick soaked shirt the harder you go at it the better your brilliant brainchild will taste at the end of its 600 degrees of amalgamation growth spurt. Listen, don't let someone else pull that piece out for you. You give yourself the glory of watching that pièce de résistance, that chef d'oeuvre, emerge with all its bubbling heat from the oven's long and swarthy kiss. Use the giant spatula and slide it into a box just like you would a pie belonging to any paying customer. Give it that respect. But here's a secret. It's for you. And that means you can slice it any dang way you want. Rectangles, squares, parallelograms, trapezoids, squircles, heptagrams, man. Book yourself a cosmic journey to Shape Town, Shape Mountain, the Shape Terrarian Sea. This pie is for you. No one else needs to see it or know about it. Let it cool. Let it mature. Believe for a moment your time belongs to you. Savor. Shoot. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to our poems. Please give it up for Carlina, Dylan, Andy, Sam, and Autumn. What amazing writers. Mario Soul, thank you so much for working hard to put this together. Everybody, please support Garrett Space. Um, this is an incredible project for young people. We have lived with way too many tragedies at Pioneer and in the Ann Arbor community. Please. Please open up your wallets and your heart. Let's support this great project. Thank you so much for having us. Tune in. Continue to tune in for the great stuff that's coming up next. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, everybody involved here. This was uh, 
Wow, this, that, that was a really tremendous hour of creative writing, of poetry, of people telling their stories. Um, I can't thank you all enough. Um, to each one of you individually, thank you. Um, that was, um, yeah, that, whew, good, good midday, uh, spiritual awakening.